Welcome to The Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're looking at Blood Quantum, a 2019 Canadian film that was released to Shudder in 2020. Blood Quantum is a zombie movie that asks what would happen if a certain subset of the population was immune to the zombie infection. In this case, the non-zombifiable folk are First Nations, the indigenous peoples of Canada south of the Arctic Circle. Blood Quantum was written, directed, edited, and co-composed Posed by Jeff Barnaby, a Mi'kmaq filmmaker, or Micmac. I've heard it said both ways. In Blood Quantum, his second feature-length film, Barnaby uses the zombie subgenre as a way to commentate on colonialism. The movie is named after the controversial Blood Quantum laws, which were established by the United States government to determine people's indigenous heritage. The government would, and still does, use that determination to sort people into racial populations for purposes of census taking, tribal enrollment elements, eligibility, and financial benefit qualification. They're a whole friggin' thing that I don't have the time or knowledge to explain right now, but it's worth noting that not every tribe uses blood quantum as a way to determine membership, but it's super weird. Zombie films aren't my favorite type of horror movie, but if you're into them, blood quantum is worth a watch, even though it's got plenty of issues. Most notably, the screenplay suffers from first draft syndrome, with a lot of the dialogue expository and clunky. Especially Especially in the first act, where it trips all over itself trying to introduce all the characters. The acting is also questionable at times, and the structure is really weird, with certain scenes and storylines feeling incomplete and jumbled. But it's not all bad. The movie is beautifully shot by Barnaby and cinematographer Michel St. Martin, and despite the subpar dialogue and acting, the characters are interesting and ended up growing on me. The best thing about the movie, though, is its exceptional gore, which is why I got a sponsor, so I could include it all uncut. Shudder is the greatest streaming service a horror fan could ask for. It doesn't waste your time with all that other BS you don't want to watch, and is instead devoted entirely to thrillers and horror movies, from cult classics to blockbuster hits. For only $5.99 a month, or $56.99 a year, you'll have access to an incredible human-curated collection of horror films, and exclusive titles you won't find anywhere else, like Greg Nicotero's Creepshow series and the brand new movie Scare Me. You can also watch Blood Quantum on Shudder, so check it out for yourself with a free 30-day trial, courtesy of yours truly, by going to Shudder.com and using promo code DEADMEATJAMES. That's Shudder.com, S-H-U-D-D-E-R, promo code DEADMEATJAMES for a free 30-day trial. One last note, this is a zombie movie, so we're gonna have some messy numbers. Just roll with the rules as I make them up. You know damn well by now that it really really doesn't matter. What does matter is that I try. So let us go forth and count what kills I can. The movie begins with a passage from the Book of Exodus, wherein God basically told Israelites to go out and smash the shit of anyone they found whose gods were the wrong ones. That's not very nice. We're at the fictional Red Crow Indian Reservation in Quebec the same year moving pictures came out. Great time to be Canadian. A guy named Gisigu, which means old man in the Mi'kmaq language, is gutting the salmon he's caught when they start flipping and flopping all over the place despite a serious lack of innards. After after a title card and the first of a few awesomely animated interludes, we get some opening credits that make me wonder how many drones production sacrificed to get these shots. Oh shit, pull up camera, pull up! The footage here also helps establish the setting, which is always crucial in a zombie flick. The Red Crow Reservation was played by Jeff Barnaby's home community of Lustigouche, a First Nations band within Quebec that sits on the Restigouche River across from Campbellton, New Brunswick. In Blood Quantum, Campbellton plays the non-indigenous town Hollerbaster, where many people from the reservation work and socialize. Blood Quantum was influenced by Barnaby's earliest memory from the same year this movie takes place. In 1981, Quebec's provincial police conducted a brutal two-day raid on the Lustigouche Reservation over salmon fishing rights. The raid was documented by filmmaker Alanis Obamsawin in her 1984 documentary Incident at Restigouche, and Barnaby cites Obamsawin right along alongside George Romero as a major filmmaking influence. Gisigu calls up the reservation's police chief, who happens to be his son, Trailer, played by Michael Gray Eyes. He shows Trailer the cooler full of dead fish. That, that thing's gutted. 
dead flopping fish. Their solution is to burn them, which I get as a go-to idea, but just make sure you don't wind up with flaming flopping fish zombies, y'all. That's what I'm saying, man. Don't let them salmon sear ya. One of Trailer's sons is Joseph, played by Forrest Goodluck, who's currently in jail in Hollerbaster, the town across the bridge. With him is his older half-brother, Trailer's other son, Alan, aka Lysol. Lysol's kind of an outcast of the community, while Joseph is the quote-unquote good son who's acting out. But neither of them are in as bad shape as this other dude in their cell, who's puking up a whole bunch of blood. Gross. Trailer comes to the towny jail, where a cop named Shamu tells him that Joseph was arrested for climbing atop the bridge between their communities and, uh, well, dropping a deuce on a little old lady driving by. Might have gotten away with it if he hadn't fallen on her car afterward. Amateur move, dude. They go to get the boys from the cell and find the blood-puking inmate now looking mighty zombified. I'll count this dude's zombie transformation as a kill, since he was seen as a non-zombie before and since we never see him die in zombie form. But when it comes to random background zombies stumbling around, I ain't counting them unless they are then killed as zombies. Joseph is bit by the zombified dude, but Shamu's able to put him down with his nightstick, but only temporarily. Dun dun zombie! Joseph is driven home by his mom and trailer's ex-wife, Joss, a no-nonsense nurse played by Elamaya Talfeathers. Look, I know your heart's in the right place, but... Your head's up your ass. She's mad that he's been hanging out with Lysol, who's always getting arrested, and who's not the best influence on his younger bro. Though Trailer admits, neither is he. The kid deserves better. Better than what? Either one of us. Yeah, he deserves someone who would crawl through snow and hibernate inside of bears to avenge him. The last character thrown at us in this onslaught of exposition is Joseph's white girlfriend Charlie, who recently found out she's pregnant with his child. They go to Joss's hospital in Hollerbaster so she can get an abortion, but decide against the procedure at the last minute. This Hollerbaster hospital is where the zombie problem's becoming a Zed-demic, as Joss sees one person in the background being killed by a zombie. Back in Red Crow, trailers just arrived at the house of a very inebriated guy named Shooker. It's kinda hard to tell what's going on, since shooker has got multiple psychoactives in his system, but it sounds like his white girlfriend had a zombie baby? Question mark? Let me give you a heads up to look away if you need to, though, cause right now his girlfriend's a zombie who's eating that baby! Oh, wow, that is some sick shit, man. No good. The zombie lady attacks Trailer and bites him in the arm, but he makes it outside and stops her by beating her with a shotgun. And not just a little bit. He crushes her head in. Holy shit, dude. I was not expecting that kind of gore. Trailer heads to the bridge where he sees an ambulance from Joss's hospital crash. And when he goes to help out, he finds the driver on the hood of the car. He rises from his dead state, but Joss grabs Trailer's gun and puts him back down with a headshot. Another zombie, a worker from the hospital, attacks Joseph in the back of the ambulance before Trailer gets them out. And she's put down when another guy named Bumper walks up with a chainsaw and puts that thing right in the middle of her head. Holy shit again! That is what I'm talking about right there! Wonderful practical effects. <laughs> Well, you're putting it to good use, guy. Gisigu joins his son on the bridge, and they once again burn the bodies, as the realization of what's happening settles in. We time jump to six months later, when things are looking pretty damn different. Hollerbaster is an empty flaming ghost town, while across the bridge, Red Crow has fashioned itself into a fortified bunker for the living, with design plans ripped straight from post-apocalyptazine. Pretty cool shot here, by the way, that evokes the photograph face-to-face -face by Shani Kamulain from the Oka Crisis, a 1990 land dispute that occurred when the Canadian government tried to expand a golf course into sacred Mohawk burial ground. Lysol is a sentinel for the res, alongside a woman named James played by Kawanahiri Debrie Jacobs, who starred in Barnaby's 2013 debut feature film, Rhymes for Young Ghouls. The two of them aren't fans of the white refugees that Joseph and Charlie keep bringing to the reservation. This dude, for instance, has brought his sick daughter Kira because he heard they can cure the virus here. But Lysol has no sympathy for them, and is paranoid of any potential Christopher's Columbus. How do you know that this fucking town he didn't come in with this refugee? Pollyanna act. They plant this infected bitch right on our doorstep. 
trailer shows up, and after seeing that Kira is too far gone to save, orders everyone inside the walls so he can do what's necessary. Using Bumper's badass murder axe, trailer waits for Kira to rise from the dead before killing her with an off-screen axe swipe. Inside the fortified walls, James shows little sympathy towards the grieving father, and reminds him that, in a reversal of the colonial tragedy that laid waste to native populations, this time the First Nations are immune to the new disease, while the white refugees are not. And don't forget, ain't nobody immune here but us. Joss talks to another new refugee, Lilith, and asks her if she's been bit. Lilith says no, but as we see in the bathroom, that girl be lying. We also see that Kira's father has killed himself by slitting his wrists, though of course, he doesn't stay dead for long. <laughs> I'll put him on the list in a minute after his zombie form is killed. I'm trying not to double count people here if they die and then are turned into a zombie who is then killed if that makes sense. In a poorly motivated scene, IMO, Trailer explains the reservation's defense system to characters who would already know all this information. It's a forced way to lead into a montage of the world they live in now, which also gives me a whole bunch of dead zombies to count. I see one getting headshotted, six piled up in a front-end loader, a couple in close-ups, and then on the bridge, where a ton of Zeds are seen alive, we get two more of them killed when this moon guy starts up. Up what I believe is a snowblower. In total, that's 11 dead Zeds. The montage ends when Trailer is summoned by that Shooker guy to deal with the bathroom stall zombie. Since he's not one to fear the walking dead, Trailer kills the Zed off screen after kicking in the stall door. Charlie, who's much more pregnant these days, tells Joseph she's worried about their baby. Worried it could be born a zombie. I have nightmares, Joseph. This baby eating me from the inside out. You're immune. I'm not. What if this baby isn't either? That's a scary thought. Maybe just kiss and try to forget about it. As Trailer and some others set out for a run to Hollerbaster, Lysol expresses concern about the growing number of white refugees. How long before it comes to pass they get tired? Being hurt by a bunch of Indians. He storms away, a pissy ball of rage, and when Joseph finds him later, Lysol apologizes for being a piece of shit. I don't think you're shit. Give it time. Yeah, give it time. Kiowa Gordon is great at playing a real nasty little bastard. That moon guy, played by veteran character actor Gary Farmer, shows up high as a kite with all the nose candy needed to make things full on 80s up in this bitch. The c c c c c cocaine encourages Lysol to hit up that Lilith chick. And while he does that, Moon opines to Joseph that the zombie virus is a way for the living, breathing Earth to fight back against the humans who have harmed it. As this planet we're on is so sick of our he says the planet is using white people as a means of reclamation. White people like Lilith here, who Joseph finds has turned into a zombie. We never see her die in zombie form, so I'll count her now as she, uh, eats Lysol's penis that she just tore off. Fuck, that's awful. After another brief animated interlude, this one getting hot hot hot, we come back to a Tarantino shot of Trailer and the gang. They head to a gas station for fuel, where they scare out one zombie that Trailer kills with a shotgun blast to the head. Inside is a second dead Zed, and a third one swings down on its intestines thanks to Bumper messing around in an upstairs room. Trailer joins him to find three more dead zombies, giving us six total from the two of them. They then go downstairs, where their count is bested by Gisigu, who I believe just murdered eight zombies with his sword, though it's kinda hard to tell with how dismembered they are. It's easy to tell, though, how much Jeff Barnaby likes Tarantino. Zed? Zed. Dead. Joseph gets his older bro back behind the guard walls, and Lysol thanks him by stabbing him in the stomach and declaring that he has no family in a Pennywise slash Scooby-Doo voice. I have no family. That wasn't no Embry call. It was a full-on fiery shout. Moon helps Lysol open the trunk where the zombified Lilith is. In a major doucher move, they unleash her among the refugees. The injured Joseph makes it back to their makeshift hospital, where he tells his mom Joss that Lysol 
Lysol just released an infectant, which is exactly the opposite of what Lysol is supposed to do. One dude tries to peace out right away, but he's attacked behind a door by a noisy zombie, and his blood seeps underneath it to all but confirm the kill. Trailer and the others get back to Red Crow and find it looking like Zed Central. With Joss begging for help over the radio, Bumper gets in the police car and makes a noisy distraction for the Zeds as Shooker opens the gate. We see, I think, nine dead bodies on the ground getting eaten by zombies. It's difficult to count, but I checked and rechecked and had editor Josh check again, and nine's what we came up with. Bumper drives away, taking all the zombies with him, which allows the others to enter the walls. Gesigu gets himself an extra kill when he stabs a legless zombie in the head with his sword. They get to the stairwell, leading to their med center, and quickly kill the two zombies they find trying to get in with Gesigu's sword. He then uses the sword to provide us with a few more blood sprays and allow Joss and Joseph to close the door on a bunch of zombies. The refugees begin to make their way outside to a rescue truck, but shit goes south in a hurry, and two unfortunate dudes fall out of the truck as it drives away and are killed by swarming Zeds. Zombies also attack Trailer and his family inside the med center, and though he shoots a few of them down, I don't think he kills any here. Behind another door, with the zombie menace about to break it down, Trailer tells his family to go, with one last request for Joseph and Charlie. If I don't make it out of here. The others go outside, where Bumper pulls up and runs over two zombies, maybe killing them. I don't know for sure, but I'll count it. Whatever. I'll also, unfortunately, count Trailer, who is killed in a pretty bloody and visceral way as zombies tear him apart and eat him up. Damn! The survivors get a radio call from Doris, the police dispatcher, who tells them that Lysol and his co-conspirators are going around killing all the refugees. They also kill Doris by unleashing a zombie on her. <laughs> is that undead Tommaso Ciampa? A new day dawns, and as Charlie gets close to baby time, Moon holds a bunch of refugees captive inside a church. He sings as he pours gasoline all over them, while James drags a headless body over to add to the future fire. These two, like Lysol, have completely othered the innocent refugees, which makes it much easier for them to be murderous and cruel. Get rid of all these fucking... Dependence was it for all. Moon shamelessly sings the praises of their kill-happy leader Lysol, but his sermon ends when Gesigu comes from behind and puts his sword halfway through his head. It's not the best looking effect, but it was still a pretty sudden kill. From James, they find out where Lysol is. He's out at the docks where Joss has Charlie, and he just put a blade through Bumper's back. Oh shit! Lysol throws Charlie to the ground and yells at her for bringing all the refugees into the reservation. Even though Joss threatens to shoot him, Lysol opens a trunk and unleashes a zombie, getting shot by Joss for his actions. The zombie attacks Charlie for a while, before Joseph shows up and stops it by cutting the Zed's head off with a machete. Beautiful shot there. But Joseph was too late. Charlie's been bit, and since she's not native, a zombie soon she will be. Joseph and Gesigu drag the injured Lysol to a field, where Joseph stabs him in the side to further incapacitate him. Gesigu summons the zombies with a gun shot, and they swarm all over Lysol, killing him by tearing him apart and eating him, just like how his dad died. And, I guess, how a lot of people die in zombie movies. I mean, it's kind of their whole M.O. Shooker shows up with a boat for the survivors, and they help the pregnant Charlie and injured Bumper towards it. Gesigu, however, opts to stay behind. I'm not leaving this land again. After we see a few more random dead bodies in a couple of shots, Gesigu makes his last stand against the Zeds. He starts slicing and dicing Zeds with his sword, and I've got to apologize, because it's really hard to say what constitutes a kill here especially as the others get further and further away from him. I'm gonna arbitrarily go with, uh, 12. Yeah, let's say he killed a dozen zombies here. As for Gesigu himself, well, he's still standing strong in this neat little animation, so let's just be optimistic and say the old man made it. Also, shout out to Gesigu's actor, MMA trainer, Stonehorse Lone Goman. This was his first, and as of yet, only feature film role, 
game, and he kicked ass in it. I'm not sure what happened to Bumper or Shooker, but all of a sudden, we're down to just one boat with Joseph, Charlie, and Joss in it. With some encouragement, Charlie pushes out a brand new baby, and in return, Joseph delivers to her some good news. The baby is healthy, and not a little Zeddy girl. Charlie holds the baby for a mo, but has Joseph take it away when she feels the zombie virus beginning to take control. Not wanting to become a Zed, she encourages Joseph to mercy kill her by shooting her in the head. Wow, that is, uh, that's a fucking downer, man. Just some real bleak shit. The movie ends with Joseph cuddling the corpse of his dead baby mama, while Joss comforts the newborn to sleep. How many bloody kills did Blood Quantum give us? Let's find out and get to the numbers. Come on, little fishy boy, let's go. Oh, oh God, oh God, it's still alive! By my count, there were 73 kills in Blood Guano, though I didn't double count anyone who died as both a human and a zombie. And the pie chart? Well, that thing's all kinds of messed up. With a runtime of 98 minutes, that left us with a kill on average every 1.34 minutes. I'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest kill to the zombie hospital employee killed on the bridge. So good to see a gnarly practical effect like this in a modern horror movie. Dom Machete for lamest kill will be the refugee who ran out of the room and got killed behind a door. And that's it. Blood Quantum came out in 2019 and is available to watch on Shudder right now. Hope you all have a happy Indigenous Peoples Day, and until next time, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. Thanks a lot for watching this Kill Count. I want to give a special thanks to Miss Corey Ray Northrup and her daughter, Zeandria. They helped make me aware of the missing and murdered indigenous women epidemic in Canada and the US. Indigenous women are murdered at a rate 10 times higher than other ethnicities, which is obviously a tragedy that needs to end. I've donated to the Native Women's Wilderness Organization to try to help, and I encourage you all to check out links in this video's description and look into local organizations to learn more about this serious problem. Take care, everyone, and be good people.